Today we're going to look at an introduction to the literary eras of realism and naturalism in American literature. First, let's introduce realism. This is a revolt against the previous movement, Romanticism. Instead of having the idealistic look at the individual and that everything is going to end up positive, we now have this pessimistic point of view that we're still in control of our lives and yet we are going to be heading towards something negative. Realism also is going to give the portraits of real life, not just its positivity and idealism, but with all of its grits. You're also going to find meaning in the commonplace, where we had these high idealistic review, uh, ideals in romanticism. We're going to be seeing in our realistic stories the common every place ideas of getting up, going to work, starting a fire. Everything that is commonplace now becomes very important. For example, you might be looking at Ambrose Bierce's writings, perhaps an occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge. We'll also be looking at the ideas of, say, perhaps Jack London when we get into naturalism. Now, we also have a little bit of a smaller era that comes in between, and that would be regionalism or American local color, color stories. Now, this is the happy medium between romanticism and realism, where you have the romantic movement, which is very positive, and the realist movement, which is very negative. You have to have something in between. Regionalism is going to capture the essence of life in various regions of the United States. Say, for example, when you want to look out west at the Mississippi in the 1850s and 60s, you're going to have the regionalist writer Mark Twain. Now, this is a way for people across the nation to kind of reconnect to their own American passions after the American Civil War. Now, they are concerned with the character of the region not so much with the individual. Character is not exactly king here, but the character of the region itself is. Stories may include lots of storytelling and revolve around the community and its rituals. So we're still looking at narrative at a lot of fiction, but we're looking more at the community and what the community could give. Because we're also looking at local color, the use of dialect to establish credibility and authenticity of the regional characters is key. For example, Kate Chopin with Desiree's Baby, perhaps her novel of The Awakening, where we're looking at characters in very suburban or even rural Louisiana. Speaking of Kate Chopin, she was likely one of the most powerful and controversial writers of her time. Now, she's focused on capturing the essence of life in Louisiana, particularly the, the local color from the Cajuns and the Creoles, of which she herself was a part of. Now, her common themes that she liked to write was on the nature of marriage, but also of racial prejudice and female equality. Kate Chopin had grown up uh, with essentially a mother and a grandmother raising her, um, and she had a husband f around for about a dozen years before he himself died as well. And so for most of her life, she was in charge of her family. She was in charge of creating money. She was in charge of raising her children. And so the very feminist equality or the ideas of the nature of marriage, of child upbringing, those are going to be key themes for Kate Chopin. Let's go ahead and introduce naturalism, which is part of the realist movement. It's going to happen after the American Civil War, approximately around 1870, almost into the mid-1900s. So, for example, we might look at Stephen Crane's A Man Said to the Universe, and he writes, A man said to the universe, Sir, I exist. However, replied the universe, the fact has not created in me a sense of obligation. So naturalism is an extension and a refinement of realism based on the theories of the French novelist Emile Zola. Now, influenced by the scientific discoveries of the time, naturalism saw humans as one of the pack, that you're not an individual like you were in the Romantic period. Now, Emile Zola coined the term human beasts to demonstrate this. Now, inspired by Charles Darwin and Thomas Huxley, Zola believed people's actions and beliefs resulted not from free will, but from arbitrary outside forces of their heredity and of the environment surrounding them.
So perhaps then we need to look at what was going on in the world. Why would Emil Zora say such a thing? Well, we had Western expansion still going on in the United States. The idea of manifest destiny, where America was destined to expand from coast to coast. And the gold rushes were also going on at this time. So there's this sense of making nature become more important, that sense of community becoming more important than the individual. Also, as America is still taking shape, you're going to notice the growth of cities and the rise of industrialism. And because of this, the environment is changing and becoming ever so more uh, populated. And so these things are going to start affecting the way humans live. So what are the major tenets of naturalism? Well, the writer must examine people and society objectively and, like a scientist, draw conclusions from what is observed. They also take the ideal of reality, the inescapable working out of the natural forces around you. Destiny is decided by your heredity and by your environment, as Emil Zora told us, by your physical drives and by your economic circumstances. Now, naturalism tends to be pessimistic because you can't quite control your environment or your economic circumstances you're going to have this negative point of view for most. It is the direct opposite of the previous literary movement of Romanticism and Transcendentalism, which saw nature as being mystical, holy, and close to God. Now, despite their underlying powerlessness, characters generally conduct themselves with strength and dignity in the face of all of this adversity, thereby affirming the significance of their existence. Now, Charles Darwin says it's natural selection and not a divine blueprint of some sort that determines which organisms live and die in the world. It's merely survival of the fittest. Now, Karl Marx also said the masses are at the mercy of a capitalist economy, which more often than not brutally exploits them. Freud says we're all at the mercy of a dark internal drive and desires that you can scarcely hope to control within you. And the U.S. population at this time is also growing at a staggering rate. Millions of people are settling into a densely crowded urban area where they seem to be living and working more and more like insects, basically. There's not a, lot, a whole lot of difference between the humans, who we like to think are individualistic and have free will, and animals, who of course live in flocks, herds, and schools, and have to run on instinct. So we take all those social and philosophical forces. How do we apply those key themes of naturalism into literature? Well, we start with Emil Zora's Brute Within. And the brute within it, each individual is comprised of strong and often warring emotions. Passions such as lust and greed or the desire for dominance or pleasure that Freud had brought up. And the fight for survival in an amoral, indifferent universe. So it is the indifference of nature as man struggles to survive. Nothing is out there to help man. Now the forces of heredity and environment as they affect and afflict individual lives are also key themes, but that sense of determinism might be our winning point. The inability to express free will, where the human is already doomed or excited from the start. There is no free will here. They are just meant to go upon their merry way, the way it's already been given. Now, naturalists fo focused on their characters' reactions in social and natural settings. You're going to see biological, economic, and environmental forces being written into literature. Because that brute within focuses on the powerful emotions within that person and the lack of free will and nature working against an individual is going to be key to the characters. Now, in social naturalism, in these literary texts, a character's struggle with society itself is shown. Perhaps maybe life in the urban jungle, such as factories, maybe perhaps your upper class society, or perhaps a changing economy in different parts of a city. So we have examples for these, especially from Stephen Crane, maybe perhaps his Maggie, a girl of the streets. 
We also have environmental naturalism. We have authors who wrote these texts that are focused on their character's struggle against the environment and human nature itself. Now, these are the ultimate survival stories. They show characters battling against nature's elements and very hostile settings. So perhaps you're going to be looking at maybe perhaps artwork by Winslow Homer as the Gulf Stream. And of course, our American author, Jack London, is going to be a huge characteristic. Now, another side to nature controlling our destiny is the nature inside of us, such as the need for food, sex, shelter, or social dominance. Now, naturalism doesn't just focus on nature's influence. It encompasses many environments, the man-made environment, or finance, industry, and the economy. Something is always beating down and controlling the lives of a lowly individual human. Now, naturalist works are more likely to be political than traditional realist works. A great many naturalists, like Upton Sinclair in The Jungle, which is about the plight of the working poor in Chicago's meatpacking industry, want to expose the cruelty of certain larger forces, more often than not America's voracious capitalist economy. So in a nutshell, our critic Donald Prizer once stated, the naturalistic novelist is willing to concede that there are fundamental limitations to man's freedom, but he is unwilling to concede that man is thereby stripped of all value. So some of our most popular American naturalist writers are going to be, as we've mentioned before, Stephen Crane, Jack London. You'll also see other authors such as Theodore Dreiser, Frank Norris, and Edith Wharton. So looking at Stephen Crane, you might be looking at some of his novels, such as we've mentioned before, Maggie, a Girl at the Streets. You might also hear about his Civil War uh, episode, The Red Badge of Courage. You might also see in textbooks for American literature, The Blue Hotel and An Open Boat, or you might see his last uh, work, An Episode of War. Now, Stephen Crane was one of America's foremost realistic writers, and his works have been credited with make marking the beginning of modern American naturalism. Now, he's been influenced by William Dean Howell's theory of realism. So he utilized his keen observations, as well as personal experiences, to achieve a narrative vividness and a sense of immediacy matched by few American writers before him. Now, literary critics today suggest that Maggie, a Girl of the Streets, was a major development in American literary naturalism, and that it introduced Crane's vision of life as warfare. It, inf it was influenced by the Darwinism of the times, and Crane viewed individuals as victims of purposeless forces and believed that they encountered only hostility in their relationships with other individuals, with society itself, with the nature of society, and even with God. Crane's naturalism, however, was tempered by his belief that in such an indifferent universe, people still must stick together with acts of kindness and compassion to counter the terrible forces to which they are subjected. And in his writing, Crane asks questions rather than provides answers. This encourages the reader to delve deeper into understanding mankind in the face of brutal natural forces. We might also see Jack London, uh, you take a look at his two major novels, The Call of the Wild and White Fang. But right before then, you might also see his short story, To Build a Fire, in a lot of American literature texts. Now, Jack London wrote passionately and prolifically about the great questions of life and death. London's known about writing about the struggle to survive with dignity and integrity. And he wove these elemental ideas into stories of high adventure based on his own firsthand experiences at sea, or in Alaska, or even in the fields and factories of his home state of California. Now, as a result, his writing appealed not to the few, but to millions of people all around the world. So Jack London once wrote, I would rather be ashes than dust. I would rather that my spark should burn out in a brilliant blaze than it should be stifled by dry rot. 
I would rather be a superb meteor, every atom of me in magnificent glow, than a sleepy and permanent planet. The proper function of man is to live, not to exist. I shall not waste my days in trying to prolong them. I shall use my time. Because if man is at the mercy of nature, then what's the point? Thank you so much for stopping by to learn a little bit about naturalism from the realist American movement. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about these particular authors or their short stories, take a look at some of my other videos on this channel. Or if I've missed out a few, if you'd like to learn more about, say, Jack London's uh, uh, White Fang, or maybe perhaps you'd like to learn about Edith Wharton or Kate Chopin's The Awakening, please leave a comment down below. Let me know which realist writers you'd like me to discuss. And as always, I'd appreciate it if you subscribed.